Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, we have journalists Mary Wilson and Karen Langley, and guess who's in the news this week? How about the Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania, Kathleen Kane? But first, we call in one of our experts for our monthly health care update. We'll be back in a moment. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, it's another big news week in the state of Pennsylvania. We'll get to a couple of big issues that uh, are uh, that uh, involves lots of voters and lots of interests in the state. But first, Dr. Stuart Shapiro, he's the CEO of the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, one of the experts we call in from time to time to give us an update on all things healthcare. I like that, all things healthcare. All right, doctor, let's let's start with uh, the budget. During the course of the campaign, uh, Governor Wolf made it very clear that a primary goal of his administration would be to make healthcare more accessible. He supports the Affordable Care Act. He wants to change the healthy PA program that Governor Corbett had to go to what we call a more traditional Medicaid program. Where, what's your sense? You follow this very closely. What's your sense of where Governor Wolf stands now and where the big things he wants to do stand uh, given the budget and given other comments made by the governor? Great. As you know, this is the beginning of the baseball season. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be in it. And, spring, and yeah. spring's finally here. Right. So I'm going to put my cap on as an umpire. Okay. And I'm going to call balls and strikes as I see them, as I always do. But I'm going to put today's focus on the elderly. Okay. And I'm going to call it, what's his budget do for the elderly? I think he said during the campaign it was going to be a priority. And I think, honestly, I could conclude that the elderly are a priority. Do I think it could be... There's. They could do a little bit more under Medicaid for the elderly and make it more of a priority, which is they're the people. I'm part of that crowd. I'm, I'm a baby boomer. You're a baby part, boomer. We're all part, right? And <laughs> I want to make sure that the Medicaid program continues to serve the elderly because they're the folks who need it. Yeah. And the Wolf Budget's a step in that direction. We look forward to working with the legislature uh, as we move forward this spring to enact a budget that, in fact, does do it. Now, put it, this in some perspective, we have the fourth, fourth largest senior citizen population in the country. Right. Uh, we're growing older just as we're getting younger with immigrants, and as everybody knows. And we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 Medicaid eligible people. Do I got that about more? More, we, but we have lots out. and lots help of elderly. Out. And the the real issue is that the cost of care to be delivered at home or in a nursing home has gone up. Right. And the the Medicaid program has to fund those increases. For example, I'm just going to pick nursing homes as an example. Uh, their ability to take care of people on Medicaid has been dramatically diminished over the last several years because Medicaid has not kept up with inflation. Example, the federal government came out last week that the three-year average of uh, what it costs to take care of somebody to buy the bed sheets and the, uh, right. and the towels and to replace things and to hire staff is about 2.5% a year average over three years. The budget doesn't provide those kind of money for nursing homes under Medicaid. Right. So we'll be advocating, as, as we always do, to help do that. People want to stay in their home. And I'm very, very supportive, obviously, as are you. We've talked yeah. about that. But it, they, Medicaid program has to look at this in a way of cost efficiency. When it costs less to stay at home, then somebody should be able to be supported by Medicaid at home. And there's 20, yeah. 30,000 people there. Yeah, let when me it, make a point. Let me make a ahead. point here. You raise it. Look, I, almost every week I talk to one of my friends who's dealing with a, with, with, you know, a, a, a mother or a grandparent that needs to get out of the home into a facility because, yeah, we want the family to take care of them. You're, you're right, as long... But it can't always happen. No, it can't. And, 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 and we don't talk about that enough. And that's the problem. Right now, there's 30,000 people, elderly people, uh, good people, who are being supported by Medicaid at home. 
Now, and most of them can be taken care of at home because they don't need 24-7 care. And their average cost of care may be eighteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars um, $25,000. When somebody needs that 24-7 care, they need to go into yeah. a place that could do that. And that costs, let's say, $50,000. Obviously, but the, it's more. Of course yeah. it's more. But the government is also paying for about 1,100 people where they're paying a lot more than $50,000 to give them 24-7 care at home. Yeah. And that doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not suggesting that no, any I of understand. those people be moved into a nursing home. But I am suggesting that this issue be looked at prospectively. All right. Important subject we're dealing with. We'll be back. We'll continue our discussion with uh, Dr. Shapiro after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Welcome back with Dr. Stuart Shapiro. We've been chatting about what I think is kind of an underreported subject, but one that's very important. Lots of elderly folks who are trying to decide whether they should remain in the home, go into uh, a, a facility. Uh, who makes that? We, well, we know who makes that decision, but who pays for it? How efficient is it? I mean, these are incredibly important decisions that, that we don't think about until we have to make a decision. One of these days, we should have a whole show devoted on how do people make those decisions. Let's do that. That would be great. But the reality is that people who are in their 30s and 40s ought to be talking to their parents or their grandparents when they're in the 50s or the 60s to begin to talk about this decision so that plans can be made. You could buy insurance if you want. You can look at your financial picture mm -hmm. and you can get ready for that day, which inevitably will come yeah, to all of us. That's a great point. It, it, there must be some kind of avoidance on it, you know, where we just don't want to admit that we're getting older, that oh, somehow that we just absolutely. don't. And maybe some, you know, it's not just the parents, but maybe the kids are saying, well, I don't know if I want to go there. Should I bring this up? Uh, but I mean, you're on to something here that we just haven't, that among the, 10 decisions that we make in our life that really matter, isn't that, wouldn't that have to be one of them? How yeah, and we are, the but, but we also ought to plan for those decisions. Yeah, that's and, what I mean. And, and so we have to start, people have to start thinking about that today. Yeah. And people ought to be thinking about long-term care insurance. They ought to think about how they're, they're structuring their own savings so they can make sure that they lead the, the in their last half decade of their life where they where they live. In. All right, we're going to do that. We're going to have you back at you know, when it works with your schedule and we'll get into that in some detail. There are a whole bunch of nuances to it. All right. Before I before I let you go, I want to talk about the status of legal reform in healthcare over the course of the last decade. We've had discussions about tort reform, about changes that took place in Pennsylvania law. I read reports where Suits against doctors are down, or at least court decisions. You know, at any actually rate. not. <clears throat> All right, good, great. That's let why me give you're, you some. Why you're let here. me give you four facts. Okay, if I can remember them. All. <laughs> Pennsylvania has among the best hospitals, doctors, nursing homes, nurses in the country. I think everybody agrees with that. Yet they're ranked as one of the most friendly to trial lawyers, plaintiff lawyers, to sue doctors in the country. Year after year after year, all the ratings of the Bar Association say Pennsylvania is a, a trial lawyer friendly state. Third, Pennsylvania ranks sixth in population, but data's come out in the last two weeks that we're second in terms of malpractice payouts oh and gosh. settlements. And the fourth is Pennsylvania ranks highest in out of state predatory lawyers who fly into Pennsylvania, they come from places like Alabama and Florida, and they come here like fly, they're attracted here because of the other things like flies to fly paper. Right. And the fact is that against 
doctors and nursing homes, hospitals, they run ads. And in the last 60 days, there have been 30 full page ads run by out of state lawyers trolling for business in Pennsylvania against nursing what homes. What is there about our state? Do we know? Yeah, it's the juries in primarily Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh tend to award high damages. So what that does is force hospitals, doctors, and nursing homes to settle cases. And remember I said we were ranked second highest in, right. in payouts? Right. Over 90% of that is settlements, not jury verdicts. Wow. Well, and oh, sure, are, the insurance companies settle so they, they don't have to don't, go through it. Right, and they, or they, if there's a case that they think they can easily win, mm -hmm. They say it's so easier all, to, to and okay, so what this like, legislature needs to do is to enact some real tort reform. They need to put limits on punitive damages for nursing homes, perhaps hospitals, that already exist for doctors because yeah. the nursing homes, while, while some suits in some counties are down for physicians, they're way up for nursing homes. The fight this, despite the fact that the federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have said Pennsylvania's improved on uh, 10 of 11 measures. You just answered my you answered my my follow up question. Look, this was very helpful. Now I want to I'm going to hold you to a promise to come in to have this discussion about this transition, which I I think is critically important, and we'll keep following the uh, whole business with tort reform and where all that goes. I thought it was having some effect, but you now tell it tell me that not as much as we uh, maybe the, we originally thought, but. There's been some effect, but nowhere no near. And these out-of-state lawyers, they're coming here and they're making lots of money. All right, we're not making lots of money here, but well, we'll pay our commercial sponsors and then we'll be back with a couple of reporters to talk about some of the big issues of the past week in the state. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania, and by the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, representing companies involved in America's most affordable, reliable energy source. To learn more, visit PACoalAlliance.com. Well, as usual, it was a big week in Pennsylvania politics, the ongoing saga of the Attorney General Kathleen Kane joining me to talk about that and more, two of the state's leading reporters, Mary Wilson, she's a Capitol reporter with Pennsylvania Public Radio, and Karen Langley, she's a Capitol reporter with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Welcome, both of you. You say... Great. Glad to have you on, right? You're sitting. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Mary, you're always good at this. You always have a good comeback. Great to be here, Terry. <laughs> so thrilled. I know. We, we, at any rate, down to serious business. Here we go again, as you know, it becomes the mantra. Supreme Court weighs in, finally make, made its decision about whether or not, you know, in effect, a special prosecutor appointed was valid, legal, and the case can now move forward. It could have moved forward anyway. Give us a quick update on that. All right, so the Supreme Court said that a Montgomery County judge that appointed a special prosecutor to hold a grand jury investigating Kathleen Kane um, for alleged leaks to a Philadelphia newspaper, um, that that was a valid appointment. Uh, now the Montgomery County District Attorney, a Republican named Risa Furman, mm -hmm. will decide if that if she will press charges. Right. And she's considering now whether to open her own investigation yeah. into Kathleen Kane. Kathleen Kane, Attorney General who denies any wrongdoing, has said that she did not leak secret grand jury information. And, um, and her, one of her attorneys in Washington, Lanny Davis, says this is just an attempt 
to, uh, to, to ruin her career by yeah. angry Republican yeah. men. Now, you make a good point. It's all up to Risa Furman who, she can make an independent judgment about whether to proceed, correct? Is that correct? It, it's up to her. This does not mean that the Attorney General has been charged with That's anything. Good point. It means that um, that the District Attorney now, you know, ha has received a, um, a, a tip, if an extensive one, and um, it's up to her to, to evaluate yeah. that and decide. She herself is running for a seat um, on, on the court. That's and so has her own calculations here, mm -hmm. um, if, if yeah. you think that politics ever plays into things yeah. like this. Yeah, she's real. Yeah. Risa Furman is the uh, district attorney of Montgomery County. She's also running for judge. So we've got this kind of complexity going on about that. But she has the grand jury presentment that recommended several serious charges against the attorney general. Obstruction, conspiracy, I Not think. No, perjury. Perjury, perjury. False swearing. Yeah, false swearing. And these are pretty serious charges, and she'll make the judgment, correct, as to whether to move forward to file charges in court and to bring the attorney general into the courtroom in theory, right, to face these charges. In actuality. In I actuality, in yeah, not in theory. <laughs> well, in theory as to whether I, yeah, you're right. Yeah. This has nothing to do with theory. <laughs> the, that's the professor in me. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's, let's turn, and plus this week also we at least ought to acknowledge that there were charges that there was special favoritism involving a friend from uh, Scranton, uh, Louis de Naples, and we get involved in another thing about whether she refused to move forward with a charge against somebody who worked in the attorney general's office. So that's still to play out, right? Yeah, and another Philadelphia Inquirer report that is not um, flattering to the attorney general, one in a, a number of these over the past year. Well, the saga continues and we'll continue to follow it. All right, Karen. If you can't pick up a newspaper, turn on a television and not read something about the Indi Indiana, <clears throat> what's known as a religious freedom or religious liberty law that the legislature looks like it's backtracking on. We had a case in Arkansas where the governor originally agreed to sign a similar law. He's now backed off and said he wants it more like the federal law. I mean, it's huge. It's in the news. Is there any relationship to what's going on in those states and Pennsylvania? So um, a lot of the outcry um, over this Indiana law has been um, by people who say that this is an attempt to allow um, discrimination against uh, gay people, transgender people, um, w which the um, Indiana legislature now it looks like may be acting to, um, to, to say something about. Um, this has caused um, governors in some states to, to say that um, you can't have publicly funded travel to Indiana and tech companies right. to speak. Out um, here in Pennsylvania, while um, we have anti-discrimination laws for things like um, housing and public accommodation, um, that is limited to things like religion, race. It doesn't include, gender, yeah. like in some states, um, sexual orientation, Station. gender identity, which is something that Democratic legislators and some Republicans, um, and also now Governor Tom Wolf, have been pushing for. So they're pushing and. Uh uh, I want to run to a break. I want to come back and finish this, and we want to get into the cabinet appointments. This is important. Uh, voters in the state and polls do, and I'm, I try to remain neutral, do show strong support for adding, you know, that provision to our own anti-discrimination suit to cover sexual orientation. I'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine, and by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Business Council and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation. I'm chatting with Mary Wilson and Karen Langley, a Capitol Hill uh, reporters in Harrisburg. All right, we were talking about the state right now, If I, just to make sure that it's clarified. We have a state law that says you cannot discriminate in housing and employment for race and gender and age, but doesn't cover sexual orientation and gender identity, correct? So what you're saying is re 
finish my thought. <laughs> that, that's right. And so um, a, a large number of Democrats and some Republican state legislators and also Governor Wolf have been pushing to add those um, categories to the anti-discrimination yeah. law. Um, now that it, this issue of discrimination against gay people um, it is, is so much in the news with this Indiana religious freedom law, um, some of Pushed the yeah. legislators and Governor Wolf are, are, are citing um, the Indiana law as you know a reason yeah. that Pennsylvania ought to go ahead and pass those bells. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to make the point in polls that have been done, the voters support, largely do support, you know, that measure, including it in the anti-discrimination clause. All right, Mary Wilson, it wasn't exactly, in the last couple of weeks, we've had, you know, questions raised about cabinet appointments. The big news, of course, was over the uh, police commissioner, state police commissioner, Marcus Brown. Uh, Republicans still holding firm that they may not confirm this guy. Well, I think they're holding firm at this point that he's going to get a hearing. He's going to get a fair hearing. But <clears throat> the the Senate, which gets to approve the governor's yep. cabinet picks, uh, Senate Republicans have been kind of the loyal opposition here um, since Wolf has been sworn into office. Right. And they've said, we really have concerns about this guy. They cite the fact that he took down two yard signs that were put up in his neighborhood, criticizing him for wearing the state police uniform when he never attended or graduated from the state police academy in Apparently Pennsylvania. Apparently that's a big deal with the troopers, right? It's a big deal yes. with current troopers. It's a big deal with retired with retired troopers. And they point to the Senate Republicans point to other things in his past, um, a, a pension agreement um, in Maryland, in Maryland the, the fact that he's collected homestead tax exemptions on um, on his wife's, uh, you know, a, a, a prop, home listed a, under a his wife in Pennsylvania MPA, yeah. and a home listed under his own yeah. name in Maryland. So. So they say that this is a question of judgment. And they've said, OK, you know, Wolf has stood by his pick. Um, Wolf has said, I'm not going to pull his name for consideration. And the Senate says, OK, we've got concerns, but, you know, let's start the hearing. Yeah. And they've said that the, the Senate Majority Leader, Jay Corman, has said that um, that this will get to a vote. So um, so I guess we'll see it will get when to it comes a vote. down yeah. to it. Yeah. What but he happens. also said it was there. And, and I'll use the two words he used distinct possibility. Right. That it wouldn't fly. Right. And there's also a pass. distinct possibility that that the guy could serve even if he's voted down by the Senate, as I understand it. He could just continue to be acting state you, police commissioner. You can act forever, is that right? I did, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually never gave that any thought. So what, uh, Karen, these hearings and, you know, where, when do they actually start? I know these cabinet officers have been making the rounds, visiting lawmakers. Is there any, do we have any sense yet about when they're going to call them in for a vote, take an up-down vote on them? I, I think that um, now that we've concluded all of the appropriations hearings, which, which took up this whole month of March, that it's getting to the time when, when um, you know, they may be scheduling so the hearings. April, they have been, April, you know, saying that they April were first deal. waiting for paperwork and then waiting right. for these appropriations uh, hearings to go on. So. Great update. Thanks for coming in. I know you're all very busy. All right. We'll see you again next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, stay well.